I think we are about to start our 2022 uh, IOM3 uh, Hong Kong AGM. Uh, my name is Tim, Tim Leung, uh, the president of the uh, IOM3 Hong Kong. Uh, on the screen, we have our honorary secretary, uh, Jennifer, and on my right, uh, our treasurer, uh, YC Lam, and the far end, uh, Roy, Ivan, George, on my left, Kelvin, Silas, and uh, yeah. KLO, and uh, they will give us a speech. And we have uh, AGM's uh, uh, webinar tonight. Uh, we also have uh, Norman Wood, uh, he's on the screen, and he, he's uh, in UK. Right. Uh, I hand over the time to you, uh, Jennifer. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. So um, good evening and welcome everybody to the 2022 AGM of the IM3 Hong Kong branch. Um, first item on the agenda is the confirmation of the minutes from the last AGM held on the 30th of April. So I propose that we accept those minutes. If everyone agrees. Yep, okay, yep. perfect. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the president's report. So uh, Tim, I'll pass to you. Thanks, Jennifer. Right, uh, this year is our election year and uh, I will hand over my job to the new president. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to share uh, what uh, I have done in the past uh, calendar year uh, since May 2020, um, including my uh, presidency, presidency term and what I have also uh, contributed in the past in the council. Uh, I joined the council since uh, 2014. Uh, I involved the um, organization organizing the uh, underground design and construction conference, uh, the overseas trip to Taiwan, uh, Three Gorges Dam, Malaysia, and the big conference for celebration of the IOM3 150th anniversary in 2019. Um, during my presidency term, uh, we have faced a diffi difficult time because of the pandemic since uh, earlier 2020. Uh, not only locally here in Hong Kong, also affect, uh, everywhere, uh, elsewhere, other countries. Uh, so in the same year, uh, we canceled our big event, annual dinner, since then. Uh, hopefully we can uh, meet together in near future for our <clears throat> annual dinner. However, uh, we are living in a fast changing world. Uh, like other international organizations, IOM3 Hong Kong uh, set up our social media platform on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, so that uh, we would be able to connect with our members uh, in such a difficult times. Uh, for your information, our LinkedIn account have uh, over 500 followers. Um, in, the, uh, in this term, uh, our RM3 uh, UK uh, have a strategy uh, about the sustainable future uh, to echo this uh, strategy, uh, our RM3 uh, HK organized a number of uh, webinar on these subjects 
uh, together with uh, our local institute, um, HKIE, Hong Kong Institute of Engineer, ICE, Institute of Civil Engineer, and uh, Hong Kong Construction Association, etc. Uh, other important activity to us uh, was organizing the Young Person Lecture Competition uh, here in Hong Kong, because this uh, competition also uh, organized uh, by virtual. This is uh, an excellent uh, opportunity to showcase the young talent in order to encourage the next generation of RN3 members. Now come to the end, I would like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation for the contribution to the council by the committee in my presidency term. Um, as mentioned in my uh, welcome message in the 150th anniversary conference, uh, the strategy goal of the Iron Tree Hong Kong is to focus on the future for another 150 years and more. So I trust that the new Iron Tree Hong Kong branch president would maintain the spirit of sustainable future as our strategy goal for next term. Thank you very much. Okay. Jennifer? Uh, thank your you. turn. <laughs> yes, so the secretary's report. Um, again, I would also like to echo Tim's words to thank the council for continued support and joint efforts and what has been uh, another challenging year. Um, in terms of meetings, we the branch held a total of six meetings during um, past year, which complied with the requirement as stated in the constitution. In terms of uh, technical presentations and site visits, uh, unfortunately with the co continued COVID restrictions, we were only able to organize one site visit. Um, we were also able to organize six webinars and a local heat of the Young Persons World Lecture Competition. Um, of particular note, um, so helping to build momentum for COP26 uh, last year um, and throughout 2021, as Tim mentioned, IOM3 HQ organized a series of virtual events, podcasts, and editorial content on the theme of sustainable futures. And as part of that initiative, as a Hong Kong branch, we wanted, to, we wanted to support this initiative and we hosted a series of webinars on this theme in Q4 last year, including uh, net zero buildings, green buildings and into reservoir transfer scheme. Uh, the webinars, both those for Sustainable Futures and the other ones we hosted were um, held really successfully with great attendance and also a thank you to all of the council members who identified suitable topics and provided great assistance for smooth arrangements. Um, we also collaborated with IOM3 um, HQ on a webinar for International Women's Day in March this year, giving our members a chance to hear from women working in different disciplines around the world. And um, I've also been elected as international representative onto the um, IOM3 uh, Hong headquarters, women in the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining, which is called WIM3. So um, it gives us good visibility um, in the uh, headquarters as well. Um, unfortunately, as we've mentioned, additional plans, site visits and overseas trips have been postponed yet again due to COVID restrictions. Um, so these planned events will be postponed until it is safe to organize physical site visits and also easier to travel overseas. In the coming year, we hope to be able to continue to offer webinars and convert some site visits into webinars for our members. And we expect another active year with many opportunities for our members and friends to exchange knowledge and participate in our offered CPD events. So we look forward to seeing everybody at upcoming events. Uh, in terms of cooperation with other institutions and societies, as well as universities and other councils, 
the branch has continued to maintain close exchange with other institutions and societies. And we have representatives on or from different committees and panels, including HKIE Materials, HKIE Geotechnical, the Blasting Working Group, Cavern Group, uh, to name a few, and NAMI. And we've had um, a number of co-organized events during the past year, which have proven very successful. Uh, in terms of membership and professional review interviews, the, um, there are some new rules around for professional review uh, applications and interviews. Um, the corporate membership for MI, Triple M, and registration as chartered engineer. The interviews continue to be conducted uh, through the UK. So at the moment, it's by video conferencing. Um, and we continue to support our applicants through the process and we'll be organizing um, an informational uh, webinar on that um, in the coming term. Uh, for the Young Persons Lecture Competition, uh, last year the Young Persons Lecture Competition Hong Kong Heat was held on the 28th of July with the winner uh, being Dio Brian Billy with his presentation on design of edible bi wax coating on nano cellulose added bagasse paper for green and waste reducing food packaging, which is really interesting. So that is the end of my report. Uh, thank you, everyone. And I will now pass to our treasurer, YC, for the treasurer's report. Uh, on behalf of uh, our MP Hong Kong branch, uh, as a treasurer, I'm glad to tell everyone, every member, that our account is very healthy. Thanks for our, our hard work uh, during the year. And uh, according to what I present in the report, uh, during the year, uh, we spent about uh, $13,000 mainly on some uh, events, including the young person lecture competitions and AGM and some webinars and visits, uh, also some um, uh, regular expenses. Uh, thank you, our member, our council member, Justin Taylor. Uh, he has audited the report and uh, all the accounts are in healthy balance. And uh, in the coming years, or I would say in the coming sections, uh, I believe our president will guide us through uh, because in the past term, uh, we are suffering, uh, we have been suffering from COVID uh, impact. So a lot of uh, webinar, uh, wishes, all kinds of uh, regular activities we couldn't um, uh, carry out. Uh, but in the coming sections, I believe that our expense will be more on how we are spending uh, on the webinars and visits to benefit our members so that uh, uh, we, we got a healthy account. So we hope to uh, uh, make all the benefits back to our uh, valuable and uh, 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 important members uh, as their benefit. So I wish you all uh, good health and uh, we stay safe. Uh, thank you. Thank you, YC. So the next item on the agenda is um, the new branch council for 2022-2024 uh, election results. And I will go through. Um, we received the following nominations and election for the next term. So uh, myself as president, Jennifer Haig, the honorary secretary will be George Ho. Uh, YC Lam will continue in the role of honorary treasurer. And the ordinary members will be Guy Bridges, Dr. Ivan Sham, Roy Hung, Eric Jiang, Franklin To, and James Yu. The co opted members will be uh, Kelvin Choi, Dr. Louis Wong, and CS Lam as the HKIE materials representative. So um, thank you very much, and congratulations to the new council. The next uh, item is the um, auditing of the accounts and uh, as council we'd like to thank Justin Taylor, uh, outgoing council member for his services in auditing accounts during the council term 2020 to 2022. And for this new term, our council member Roy Hung has um, 
been nominated and kindly agreed to take on the responsibility of auditing the accounts. So thank you, uh, Roy, for taking that on, and thanks to Justin for his um, services. Um, the next item, we have a special agenda item to report. Um, we propose to amend the IOM3 Hong Kong branch constitution, rule number six on council officers to reflect changes made in the IOM3 headquarters whereby the immediate past president is included on the next term's council. Thus, we propose to make a minor change to the constitution, which would read that um, the council, um, the office bearers, would change from being the president, honorary secretary, and honorary treasurer to the president, honorary treasurer, uh, honorary secretary, and the immediate past president. And then also that would be the only change to include the immediate past president as an additional um, office bearer. And then we would have the same number of council members and uh, co-opted members. So I propose that change, um, if I could have a, a seconder. I second it. Thank you, YC. And all those in favor, please raise your hands. If you're online, please use the, either turn on your screen and raise your hand or use the reactions button and raise hand and we'll take the vote. So thank you, James. Thank you, Franklin. Um, Eric, uh, yep, Andy, thank you. Norman, if you can just, if you're okay with that, Norman, if you could. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got thumbs up. Right. Um, okay, I'll give everyone a couple more seconds to hit the right buttons and Roy, Roy, yeah, as you stop. yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> in the meeting will all right okay. all right you can see okay perfect i wasn't sure if i could see everyone okay perfect so thank you everybody um we will note that down as having passed and amend the constitution accordingly so i will put is there any other business no no? Okay, well then... Then um, congratulations to the new terms uh, leading by our president, Geneva. Thank you. <laughs> yes, um, I take on your note about the sustainable futures, Tim. Yes, definitely. I yes. hope uh, I uh, could stay here as a immediate past president to maintain the momentum and Make sure, make sure everyone you are doing the right job. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. All right. Yeah, so no, it's a great council and we're really looking forward to the new term. Um, so with that, I will, um, if there are no, uh, and not any other business, then I will say that the AGM is closed. Thank you. 6.25. So thank you. Um, what we'll do now is we said there's going to be a five minute uh, break um, just to let other people join. And then we will um, begin the webinar and I will introduce our uh, guest speaker and our, honor yeah, our honorable speaker. And then um, Roy will introduce um, our other two speakers. So we'll just take a little five minute break. All right. Okay, we will okay. be back in five minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All Good right. evening, everyone, and welcome to the AGM webinar. Um, the, AG, the AGM has been concluded, so thank you. And now um, we would like to begin the webinar. This evening's uh, webinar is on the legacy of the Lin Mahang lead mine in Hong Kong, past, present, and future. And I'm delighted to introduce this evening our guest of honor, Norman Woods, <laughs> uh, who is joining us from the UK. Uh, 
Thank you, Norman, for joining us. So um, Norman might be known to some of you. He is an engineering geologist with more than 40 years experience, having worked in Hong Kong, China, Fiji, Malaysia, Afghanistan, as well as assignments in Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, and Vietnam. It's quite a list, Norman. So he's yes. worked for 17 years with the Geotechnical Engineering Office, which was formerly the Geotechnical Control Office and later the Lands Department uh, in Hong Kong. And he subsequently worked with uh, Jacobs China in Hong Kong and most recently was a member of the SMEC team carrying out detailed design of a future highway over the Hindu Kush Mountains in Afghanistan. That must have been an amazing, uh, amazing trip. Um, also, um, with IOM3 Hong Kong, um, Norman has been secretary, chairman and committee member uh, since 1988 in, in different roles. Um, he's a professional review assessor for corporate membership of IOM3 and CN since uh, 94 and for several years, the Hong Kong coordinator of professional review interviews for IOM3. Um, he was also uh, for two years a member of IOM3 membership committee in London. And in Hong Kong, we've been very fortunate that he's kindly arranged num numerous CPD activities for our members here, including evening technical meetings and overseas site visits. So some of particular note are in, in 89, he uh, helped organize a rock heaven a conference in Hong Kong, which is interesting given that just last year as part of, uh, we were looking at rock caverns, um, there was another talk on that. So it's uh, still a, a topic of interest. Um, he's also organized uh, tours for us to the Philippines, Thailand, um, uh, again to the Philippines, to Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia. Um, and uh, in relation to this evening's talk in the early 90s, um, Norman, along with other geo colleagues, carried out an investigation of Hong Kong's abandoned mines to assess whether they represented a potential hazard to the public. Um, and these mines included the Maun Shan iron ore mine, Needle Hill tungsten mine, the West Brother Island graphite mine, and the Lin Ma Hang lead mine. So thank you so much for joining us this evening, uh, Norman. And we're really, really uh, interested to hear what you have to say. Um, before um, you get started, I'll hand over to Roy to introduce our other two speakers. And as a point of note, if there will be a Q&A session um, at the end. So if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please um, add them into the chat box and then we can um, look at answering those uh, as we, uh, at the end in the Q&A session. So please just put them in as we go along this evening and we'll answer them at the end. So Roy, if I could ask you to introduce our other two speakers this evening. Right, thank you, Jennifer. So uh, if this is Roy Hong from the council and um, let me introduce the two distinguished speakers. Uh, they both will speak on the uh, Lima Hank Abandoned My Revitalization Project. And this project I believe is the first of this kind in Hong Kong. So um, uh, first, uh, it's my great pleasure actually to introduce uh, uh, Kelvin. Right, uh, Kelvin, who is a fellow of our institute, uh, is a very experienced engineering geologist with over 40 years of practice in Hong Kong. He joined the Geotechnical Engineering Office, um, formerly called the uh, Geotechnical Control Office, where it was founded in 1978. And he formed the Terrain Evaluation API unit to apply the geomorphological and terrain classification technique to a variety of engineering geological and geotechnical studies. He used systematic terrain classification or geomorphological mapping in the mid-level um, of the building development in uh, 1979. He also led the Hong Kong Geological Survey in the 1983 and also a geotechnical area study program at that time. Uh -huh. uh, his focus uh, was the early input of geotechnical information for planning and land management purposes. Uh, particularly using computer mapping techniques. He then was uh, the geotechnical, uh, the chief geotechnical engineer field management, looking after um, marine fuel, coral search, and uh, mud disposal for the airport and associated infrastructure projects at that time. 
uh, in the year of 2006 to eight, he was the technical reviewer on the geotechnical engineering offices and has natural terrain uh, landslide infantry. And back in the year of 2011, he began a decade with uh, the consultant firm Frugal, leading their engineering geological service team in the natural terrain hazard assessment, design events review, landslide investigation consultancy, and a range of international projects. Government special interests also include the development of automated terrain classification for site characterization and asset management, impacts of uh, seismic events on large landslide, and, and also a uh, landform uh, evolution. In the year of 2017, Evan has been the chair of the Hong Kong Regional Group of the Geological Society of London. He remains committed to and uh, promoting professional standards through the chartership for uh, young geoscience graduates, those uh, graduates from the program in the Hong Kong U, I believe, and also reinforcing the need for appropriate uh, tertiary uh, course content, increasing the private industry training, improving the interdisciplinary recognition of the uh, engineering geologists and increasing the community and societal awareness of the role of geologists in a safe development and appreciation of the extreme events. And next uh, is about our the second distinguished speaker, Mr. K.L. Lowe. So Mr. Lowe, uh, professional member of this institute, is also my colleague in the geotechnical engineering offices, is a civil and geotechnical engineer with 25 years of experience and has been involved in the design and supervision of many major infrastructure and development projects in Hong Kong, mainland China, Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Australia. After graduating from the University of Hong Kong, Mr. Lo worked with uh, the consultant firm AECOM for 20 years and have been responsible for design of geotechnical works, including site formation, reclamation, deep excavation, tunnels, and cabins. Some recent local projects include the Twin Moon Chat Lab Code Link, NTR Satin to Central Link, etc. And uh, he has also been involved in a number of private development projects uh, adjacent to operating um, metro tunnels in Shanghai. And he was also a resident engineer to supervise high speed rail construction uh, in Vietnam, uh, in, in mainland China. In the year of 2017, uh, Mr. Lo joined the Hong Kong government as a geotechnical engineer in the lands department and is currently with the geotechnical project division of the GEO, looking after um, the Lima Hang abandoned my revitalization project that will be the topic of uh, our talk tonight. Uh, he will be introducing uh, the details of the project and also, actually, his daily work also includes some other R and D project in relation to Kevin and Tunnel. For example, the development of vibration resistant spray concrete lining and vibration resistant well, uh, engineering cementitious material. So, may I uh, now invite Mr. Norman Wood? Right. Uh Right, okay. Um, share screen, I take control, shall I? Yes, please do, Norman. Okay. Okay. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to apologize in advance if I stumble over my words, as um, this is rather a strange situation. I'm quite happy to talk to live audiences. But when I'm talking to a, a cyber audience, as you are, um, it's sort of, a, it, it's a bit bizarre in that I'm sitting here several thousand miles away, just basically talking to myself. <laughs> now, um, how, do I, how do I get this on the screen? Ah, can, can everyone see that? Jennifer, can you see? Yes, we can see Norman. That's perfect. It's uh, on large presentation mode. Great. Okay. Right. Now, let's go back to the beginning where all this started, this, um, this examination of the old mines in Hong Kong. It was in late 1990, I think it was November, when 
the then principal government geotechnical engineer, Dr. Andrew Malone, tasked us with examining the mines to see if they uh, represented a, a threat to the public, a, a public safety issue. And um, we, we were fortunate at the time that we had access to the mine section, the mining records from the mine section of Labor Department as it was then. Um, now the group of people um, who carried out the work looking at these old mines was um, my old friends, Trevor Williams, who fortunately was a mining engineer um, and also uh, Keith Roberts. But we were supported by um, our friends from the Geological Survey of Hong Kong, in particular, Paul Strange, and for the West Brother Island graphite mine, um, a gentleman called Richard Langford, who maybe you're not, not familiar with. I, I felt that, I think we all felt at the time that after these mines had closed down, we, we were probably the first group of people who had entered the mines, um, maybe apart from those, those people who um, directly after they'd been abandoned, went in to loot the uh, various uh, <laughs> important um, things like you know, railway lines and, and anything that was of value. Um, now uh, on the screen here, this map here shows the four mines that we, we examined. Uh, it was the Mayan Shan iron ore mine, the Needle Hill Wolfram mine, um, the West Brother Island graphite mine, and also Lim Mahang, um, the lead mine. Now we started off with Mayan Shan iron ore mine because it was clearly the most productive mine and probably the most professionally managed mine of all the abandoned mines in Hong Kong. Now, the, the, key, the, the key mineral they were looking for that was being extracted from that mine was, was magnetite. And my understanding, I'm not a brilliant geologist, but my understanding is that the magnetite was part of what's called a SCARN deposit, um, which is a result of um, the hydrothermal fluids, it's contact metamorphism um, of the country rock uh, overlying the granite body, which I believe now is called the Chartin Pluton. Um, the, the map here shows um, the extent of the mine. Um, what, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but the, the area up at the top here near the village of Man Sen Chun, um, they, they were the uh, open cast workings. And uh, are we, are we, are we a wee bit further to the northwest, uh, there will be the underground workings. And then from there, there was a, a haulage drive about two kilometers long that extended out to um, what was the processing plant, um, just which at the time was on the coast. And that was close to what is now Maran San um, town. Um, this is very briefly uh, the history of the mine. Um, originally, as I mentioned before, it was uh, an open cast operation in the area, which I hope you can see is cross hatched over here where my point is pointing out to. Um, but the, the, mine, uh, the mining became progressively deeper. They were following the ore body um, downwards, you know, with depth. And um, it, it eventually reached down to a level of about 144 meters. That's 144 meters PD. Um, at that stage, all the ore or the mine, all the mine material had to be taken up from that level back up to the 240 meter level, which was really the, the heart of the mining operation. Um, but that was very inefficient, um, taking the material back up because material got up to the top there, then it had to be hauled all the way down 
um, this very narrow winding road back down to the processing plant, which, as I said, was at the time on the coast. So what, what the company did um, in the early 1960s was they, they drove um, a two kilometre or just more, I think it's 2.2 kilometre haulage drive from the 110 metre level all the way out to the processing plant. Um, sorry, I'll, let me just go back. And that made the whole operation um, much more efficient. Um, as I said here in the, in the text, um, by the early 1970s, the mine was producing about 400,000 tonnes of ore annually. And the majority, if not all of that, um, that material, uh, sorry, of the, the, the iron ore was being exported to Japan. But um, later, by the mid 1970s, um, Australia was really getting going with all their mining, all their iron deposits. And it was economically better for Japan to import at scale, i.e. making it more economic, at scale from Australia. Um, unfortunately, Ma and Shan lost the, uh, the contract they had, a supply contract with a Japanese um, company, presumably making steel. Um, they lost that contract and then the mine had closed down, basically. It stopped operation in 1976. And um, its mining license expired in 1981 and the mine was finally abandoned. Um, this, this plan here is at the 144 meter level. This is the last level in which they were extracting ore. You know, they were stoping the ore. Um, as, you'll, as you'll see from this, um, I'm sorry, there's not a legend here, but in, in, in the center, in the center, in the core of that level of the mine, um, there was marble and it was the marble, these calcareous country rocks that actually developed this, this halo, this, um, this, I think it's called a tactite, uh, a mineralized tactite around the core of, um, uh, of the marble. And it's actually, it's worth, it's worth noting that, um, that, uh, that, sorry, I'll go back, that um, this is actually the only place in Hong Kong where you can, uh, where the marble, you, you can actually see marble in situ, you know, rather than from cores, from boreholes. Um, it's basically the same marble as occurs up in Yunlong, where, of course, as we know, there's been, there were in the past lots of problems with foundations. Um, let me move on to the next one. Now, this is, this is a cross section through the mine, well, through a part of the mine. Um, the stopes, this is where you actually extract, you mine the actual ore from. Um, the, at the top left-hand corner, we have the 240 meter level portal. And when we, when we carried out, when we carried out our investigations of the mine, these early investigations, um, this is where we could access, this is where we could access the mine. There was one portal um, that was open at that point. Uh, but then you had to descend down this incline, down to the 144 level. Um, you could then explore um, all workings on that level, but then you had to go back down, go down another incline, <clears throat> down to this haulage drive that I mentioned before, that went out over two kilometres, uh, back to the portal, which was... Well, well you, you can actually still see it. It's on that little road um, that leads up from the big roundabout near Hang On Estate. Um, these are just a few pictures uh, from 1919 to 1991. 
Um, a picture, a picture up on the right, uh, top right there. That's the entrance to the 144 meter level, which is where the, um, the, the that was the lowest level in the mine where uh, the mining was actually carried out. Um, over on the left hand side here, that's the top of an ore chute. So what would happen um, at this stage in the development of the mine was that all of the ore being extracted from the stopes above it would be dropped down, um, dropped down these chutes, these vertical shafts, some 30 meters um, down to the one, 110 meter level. And then it would be taken out on uh, skips um, out, out, out to the processing plant near the coast. On, on the right hand side here, um, that's just a view down the, the haulage drive. Okay, now um, I, I've, got, I've got to say right now that, that many of you may have been into this mine before and you would have been within a group, maybe it was the Geological Society of Hong Kong or IOM3, and you would have thought that maybe the work that we carried out was not a big deal, but you must bear in mind that we had some old mine plans from the Labour Department, they they weren't they weren't that wonderful. Um, we, we knew we knew that there was a portal at the top, and we found that it was open. There was a portal right down the bottom that was open, but we had no idea what was in between. So we could have gone into the mine, which was an absolute labyrinth of tunnels. We could have gone in there. We didn't know how dangerous it was. If we'd gone down halfway and found that there had been a, um, a roof that collapsed in a tunnel, we'd have to walk all our way, walk all the way back up again. So it was, uh, to be quite honest, it was quite an adventure. And to some of us, it was um, more like a government sponsored suicide mission. <laughs> now, it, it, it's, I must reiterate this, and I've said this so many times in the past, that it's actually, it can be very, very dangerous unless you're with people who have got experience of working underground and you've got the right safety equipment, it can be very dangerous. You can get lost in the mine. Uh, if your torch goes out, for example, and you wandered off from the party that you're with, you get lost, it can be very dangerous. You may never be found again. And, um, and certainly, there are parts of the mine, well, there's obviously there's these, these ore chutes there, which are very deep. They're like 130 meters deep, 100 foot deep. If you fall down one of those, then you're dead. And there are parts of the mine where um, it's, if there's blockages in parts of the mine, as there was for Trevor, Trevor Williams and I, um, there was one place where there was an incline which we tried to explore, but it was blocked at the top. And the air was so bad, meaning simply meaning that there was a lack of oxygen. And both of us uh, felt pretty bad. We, we had to retreat from that particular area pretty quickly, feeling dizzy. Um, we've asked in the past, one of our recommendations in our work was that the, the portals should be completely sealed up, except allowing access in and out for bats, of course. Um, I don't think that was actually done. I think it was half-hearted by the relevant authority. And we're still getting groups of people. Well, when I was in Hong Kong, there's still groups of people, including old age pensioners going into the mine. And at one stage, um, the last time I went in, um, we came across a group of people, of youngsters, I think they were teenagers, who'd gone into the mine, maybe as a bit of an adventure. <clears throat> we caught up with them. Um, they weren't wearing hard hats. Um, one of them actually was wearing sandals, which was absolutely crazy. And we put the fear of the God into them. We pretended that we had authority and we, we, we told them, we threatened that we'd call the police. 
Um, and I, I do emphasize that you really shouldn't go into these places un unless you're accompanied by people who know what they're doing and understand the layout of the mine. Okay, I'll move on. Um, Wolfram Mining in Hong Kong. Um, Wolframite is, um, it's the, shall we say, the go-to mineral um, for producing tungsten. And tungsten is an extremely hard mineral and it's um, useful for a variety of purposes. Um, one is for um, military purposes. And in the, in, the 19, in the 1950s, because of the Korean War, there was great demand for wolframite and therefore tungsten. And as I mentioned here, this is not tongue in cheek, the people of Hong Kong, Ever, ever ready to seize an opportunity, went off out into the countryside to look for the stuff. <laughs> um, on the map here, um, it, it shows it shows the Needle Hill mine, which was the, the key producer of wolframite, but also um, there were there were exploratory edits and small small mining operations um, extracting. Uh, wolframite all, all over Hong Kong. Um, Need Needle Hill was a bit of a disappointment in the sense that um, we we really didn't. No, it was very difficult to enter the workings. But anyway, let let me just go back. Um, this is a very brief history. So I'm saying here that. Um, Prospects prospecting in the area was started in the mid 1930s, and um, mining activity continued um, throughout that period in the Needle Hill Wolfram mine. Um, and it was actually quite a successful operation. As I mentioned here, um, more than 200 tons of wolframite extracted from the Needle Hill mine it, during the 70s. Unfortunately, um, when the Korean War thankfully had come to an end, um, the, the value of Wolfram um, reduced. And it was late later on in that decade that um, the mine just become, became uneconomic to mine. Um, and the mining lease um, expired at the end of the 70s and then the mine was finally abandoned. Um, th this, this picture here, this cross section, this is just through, just through one of the um, veins, um, you know, carrying, hosting the, wolf, uh, the wolframite. And this, this was from, this was produced by a, a very nice gentleman called Dr. Stephen Hoy. Um, Steve, Stephen, uh, you probably don't know. He was, um, he he was really the he was the benefactor of what was then IMM Hong Kong back in the eighties. Um, he was a mining engineer and a mining geologist uh, with experience all over the world. And in in the nineteen eighties, he 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 provided. Um, his whole mineral collection, which was, as I say, collected worldwide to Hong Kong University. And I understand that they've now got um, a, a museum of all the art artifacts um, that he provided. Um, Stephen, Stephen, as I say, was a benefactor of IMM. And he, he, he would host our committee meetings in the 80s um, in his headquarters in what was called, uh, I'm sure it's still there, called a central building in, in central. Um, in uh, committee meetings were held in very, very plush surroundings. Um, unfortunately, um, Stephen passed away in, um, I think it was about 1989. Um, as I mentioned, it was a bit disappointting, our exploration work um, a Needle Hill. We, we could only gain access to one edit, as I show there, edit number eight. And here's a picture of my colleague, 
uh, Keith Roberts when he was somewhat younger, uh, exploring inside uh, that added. Um, it was very, it was very difficult. You, 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 the, the, it was very limited what we could explore because, um, as I sh show here, that that was that that's a timber ladder way down to the lower levels. Um, it was all rotten. It was very dangerous to to try and explore deeper. Um, and, and 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 further down, the, the mine was completely flooded. Now this was this was quite a surprise. West, West Brother Island, um, the fact that um, they actually mined graphite in Hong Kong. Now, um, graphite, as I mentioned here, um, it occurs in seams within carboniferous meta sediments on the island. And apparently it's um, <clears throat> that the quality of the Graphite is due to um, the thermal metamorphism uh, as a result of the um, underlying granite. Um, I said here that um, previous researchers um, identified that seams in the mine were up to four and a half meters thick, which is quite substantial. Um, the mining on West Brother Island started in the in the fifties, in the early fifties. And um, the majority, I believe it was the majority of the graphite from the mine was exported to both the UK and the US and was used for the production of control rods in nuclear power stations. Unfortunately, um, because, because the, the mine extended so deep, um, the workings could, obviously be easily um, 90 meters below sea level obviously there was a potential for flooding and there were difficulties with ventilation and consequently the the company who were operating the mine um, had to put a lot of money into um, providing uh, pumping and, and also for ventilation and because of these factors um, the mine became econ un, sorry, uneconomic and um, we actually stopped mining in 71. And then finally, the mining license expired in 73 and the mine was abandoned. The picture over here, uh, sorry, this, this um, aerial photograph over here um, shows you just some of the buildings associated um, with the mining operation. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but where I'm pointing to here, this is the area here where they, they laid out the, the material for, for drying, the graphite for, for drying. And also there was a, from there, there was a jetty that would um, take, take the material to wherever, to export it, um, take it, take it to, cargo ships that would take it back to the US or the UK. And on this side here, there were other addits here, but when we visited in 1991, these addits were all blocked up, couldn't get in. We can only get into an addit over here where I'm pointing to on this side here. Um, this, the plan on the right hand side, just gives you an indication of the extent of the workings. Now, this photograph is we, we took as we were approaching the island in 1991, myself and <coughs> that gentleman, Richard Langford. Um, of course, as I'm sure you know, that West Brother Island doesn't really exist anymore. It's been completely flattened. And I understand that it's used for some sort of or no aircraft landing facility. Um, this, the picture up the top right here, um, this is as we were approaching the island. And as you see in front of you there, um, the, the, that was the area where there was a jetty to take the ore away to where it was gonna go. And the bottom right, um, that was inside this 
this one edit that we can actually access. Um, it was pretty dangerous. Um, you'll see that there are these props here. They were timber props. Um, there was a lot of collapses. You, you, you couldn't really couldn't get in very far into the mine. Right. Um, now I've got a couple of slides from Lim Mahang. Um, I won't spend too much time because um, Kevin and KL are going to explain uh, much more and provide you with much more up-to-date information. Um, but I was asked to explain how the leg got there. <laughs> um, well, the, the Galena is hosted by this array of quartz veins, uh, which occur within the um, the tufts, with the ash tufts, um, which are a part of the, <clears throat> what I understand now is classified as the Time Ocean Formation. Um, they can be several meters in thickness. Um, and besides the galena, which is, you know, your lead ore, uh, your lead mineral, um, there was a various other various other um, minerals and, and also apparently there was some there was some uh, silver associated or contained within these veins um, now when, when we when we researched to find out the history of the mine um, there was references to mining in the area but presumably very very small scale mining that went back to the early 19th century. But it, it was only much, much later, in the beginning of the 1900s, um, when there was more formal arrangements for mining in the area. And by the mid 1930s, um, the mine in that area had become well established and uh, apparently very well run. Um, there was a lot of underground development and um, also there was what was at that time a, a modern processing plant. And uh, records tell us, mine records tell us that daily our ore output um, exceeded 150 tons of ore a day, which is quite substantial. Um, sadly, during the war, when um, Hong Kong was occupied by the Japanese, and even subsequently, um, the, the way in which the mine was operated wasn't really, I suppose you wouldn't call it, it wasn't very professional. Um, they had this subcontracting arrangement whereby you might have, you know, two or three different subcontractors and they, they were paid based on the quality of the material they extracted from the mine. So consequently, <laughs> um, e each of them would want to get the best quality ore out of the mine and that they would be, I mean, the, the, the mining, the mining was carried out in a very haphazard manner. So you, you were getting situations where um, what one particular contract would be working on one level, uh, another one would be working underneath and they could cause a collapse of the uh, of the workings directly above. Um, anyway, um, so uh, I mean, eventually the mine closed down, and as I said here, the mining lease was rescinded by the Hong Kong government in the early sixties, and the mine closed down. These are a couple of rather poor quality photos. But this is from, you know, way, way back at the end of the 90s, when it was Trevor and I who explored the workings, which I must say we found to be the most under, the most, sorry, the most dangerous of the mines that we'd gone into. Um, one of the difficulties we had at that time was that, um, Lim Mahung was in what was called the frontier closed area. So we had to get special permission from the police, the Hong Kong police to enter the area. And that could be very time consuming. 
um, we we actually we access the area of the Limahang mine through, and I'm sure it was, it was through um, the gates into the frontier closed area at Taku Ling. Then we go in, um, we go to, uh, there was a police post for further along the road there towards Limahang. We'd have to sit there with the police waiting for permission to go further. We'd go along with them. We were accompanied by the police. And then when we got to the, um, the closest point to the, the mine workings, um, if the police had gone off somewhere else, we'd have to wait till they come back for them to then um, open the gates to allow us to go inside. So as I say, it was, it was quite time consuming. Um, and subsequently, after our, our work for a few years afterwards, um, we, we got contacted by the police to ask us, oh, do you mind coming back? Because there was a suspicion that illegal immigrants um, from across the border were coming in and, and using the, um, the, the, the mine workings as a sort of refuge on their way, on their onward uh, movement uh, in, into the say the urban areas of Hong Kong, and so there were occasions when I, I had to go out and go up and find if there was anything there that's any evidence that people have been using the workings. And yes, indeed, there was. Um, I, I would go into a particular edit, and there were signs that people have been sitting there and. Um, eating their eating their food and having a drink there were sort of like bottles of coca-cola and all sorts of things <laughs> now i don't know how much time i've used up because um because with the, this 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 is on the screen i can't see the actual time um but i think it's if you've got questions please ask me later on um and maybe it's time. Yeah. What's the time, uh, Jennifer? How am I doing? <laughs> we, we, you, you've, um, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Norman. Um, I think that was your last. Yes, perfect. Um, okay. As you mentioned, any questions, please put them into the chat box, and we'll review and um, we'll go through the questions in the Q and A section. Um, thank you so much, Norman. It's fascinating to hear about the different mines and uh, the different ores of bodies that they were um, extracting. Uh, over the different decades. Um, we'd now like to hand over to Kevin and KL, um, who are with the committee in Hong Kong. Okay. So maybe Norman, if you can stop sharing the screen so that oh, okay. uh, Kevin and KL can take over. Thank you. Is that, have I turned off? I can still see your screen. How do I turn it off? Uh, um, hey, 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 okay. What do I put? New share? Uh, uh, sure. Let's see. Yeah, okay. How do I turn it off, Jennifer? Uh, what do I do? Um, Resume share or new share or what? No, you should be able to turn it in the share button on the top of your screen to the right hand side. It says share. Maybe if you press that, then it will get rid of it. Ah, that's it. Perfect. Thank you very much, Norman. No problem. Okay. <laughs> yes, Luba. Hi. The screen. Yes, we can see the screen. Uh, from beginning. So, George. Hmm. Hi. Yeah. Please. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. 
Okay. Yes, we can see the screen. Please start. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening. I'm KL Low from GEO of CDD. Uh, I'm pleased to share with you uh, our projects, uh, the revitalization of Lin Mahang and my cave. Um, the project proponent is uh, Agricultural, Fishery and Conservation Department. Uh, GEO of CDD is the Rex Works Agent. And Maha Infrastructure and Environmental Limited is appointed by GEO as a consultant for investi uh, investigation, design and construction of the project, which commenced in April 2021. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of the background of the project, and then uh, Kevin will, uh, will talk about the detail of the study. Nimahangma is uh, immediately to the south of the border uh, between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, and is located within the future World Business Country, for which AFCD is undertaking the preparation works for its destination. AFCD plans to revitalize the Nimahang Net Mai site as a country park outdoor education spot that showcases the mining history and best ecology of the site to the general public. Uh, this is the, the, our study area. And the yellow line is the boundary of the Lin Mahang that my site of special scientific interest. And the main cave is over here. The level of the main cave is at around nine, uh, 180 MPD. The mines was developed by a series of edits at different levels and locations. There were over uh, 2,000 meters of tunnel excavated with multiple entrance. Gallery has been cut into a hillside for forming level as shown on the historical bank on the left, which is, is uh, surveyed in 1950. Level one, level two, and level three edit is over here. Uh, this is the uh, Imbahang Road and the higher level at, our, at about 180 is the level five and level six added and tunnels. A cross section along here is shown in the cross section below. The main cave line is at level six over here and uh, also uh, below is level five. And level one and level two is projected near ground level. The plan on the right is showing the all of the edit and tunnels uh, collected from historical plan. Uh, level one, two, and three is over here near the border row. Uh, at the loft, to the loft of the row is Shenzhen. And a higher level is uh, level five and level six. The photo below is shot from mainland at about this position. Uh, you can stay, my build, new buildings and mining office is over here, as shown in photo below. The Miser is an important historical relic featuring one of the most extensive mining systems in Hong Kong's mining history. As it was not only the largest mine in Hong Kong, but also the oldest commercial, commercial one. About the history of the mine, in 1986, Net was first discovered in Shuttlecock. Old works known as Portuguese working were, was reported at the door level of the mine. And in 1915, main outcrops of, of mine was discovered by Chinese miner, a company formed in 1917 and operated for three years. In 1925, a 75-year lease was issued by government to Maurice Brown Young. 
there was a substantial development of the underground oil body at that time. Morris Bang Yong operated the mine for a few years until his death. Then, in 1937, the mine was transferred to Hong Kong Mines Company Limited. At that time, uh, the company construct made the largest development of the mine, and new buildings and workshops were constructed, and uh, about 500 miners were hired at that time. In 1940, um, after the occupation by Japanese, the extraction activity was held due to the war, and only scale operation was carried out. Uh, after the war, the site was abandoned, and the mill and other building equipment was stripped off uh, after time. From 1951 and 1954, because of the of the company, Hong Kong might decide not to undertake its own mining operation. And contractor was employed to operate the mines. In 1958, with decline in the price of lead and reduced availability of workers, the company decided to temporarily shut down the mine to look for new investment but not successful. In 1962, the company was financially destitute and was unable to restart working at the mine. The government decided to rescind the mine needs, thus ending the company's right over the property. From 1951 to 2016, Nima Hang was within the frontier coastal area. During this period, the natural and remote environment was generally undisturbed by human activity. In 1990, government conducted ter territorial development strategy review. Under the board conservation strategy, Nima Hang is highlighted as a significant land conservation area in view of the natural attribute, ecological diversity, and landscape quality. The galleries in Nima Hang Mai provide an undisturbed resting ground for bats and has become one of the most important bat colonies in Hong Kong and designated as a site of special scientific interest in 1994. Bobin's nest function as an ecological corridor between the Wu Tong Shan National Forest Park in mainland and the Pashin Land Country Park. It has high ecological value and potential. In January 2000, 2008, government announced to reduce the coverage of the frontier coast area from 2,800 hectares to about 400 hectares. The FCA re reduction was implemented in three stages from 2012 to 2016. So after 2016, Nima Hang is no longer a uh, frontier coastal area. The red boundary is the uh, old frontier coastal area and the hazard area in yellow is the current frontier coastal area. So the area has been reduced by 85%. In 2009, planning department embarked on a study to examine the development potential and constraint of the land to be released from the FCA and to formulate a planning framework for preparations, statutory time plans to guide the conservation and sustainable development of the land. Development framework is proposed under the study. For strengthening natural conservation, potential country park at Wobin's Nest, including the Nin Mahang Net Mai sites of special scientific interest was identified. For conserving cultural heritage resources, 
high interest with heritage theme to link up clusters of heritage feature is suggested in order to attract more tourists and provide more incentive to conservation and realization. The red boundary is the proposed uh, Woburn Snack Country Park and in, within an uh, adjacent country park, uh, there are two McIntosh Fort, look like this, and the uh, Lima Hang Nemai Caves is over here. The line in Bang is the proposed hiking track. Following up that suggestion, in the Hong Kong Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, government announced to commence the preparation for the destination of Wolverine's Nest as a new country park, serve as a logical corridor between Hong Kong and Shenzhen. In, 2000, uh, in the policy address 2017, government committed to conserve more site with high ecological significance and will commence work to on a designating Wolverine's Park. Then AFCD start the consultancy work and design work for, <clears throat> for the destination of Mobin's Nest. AFCD also plan to engage relevant ecological and geotechnical experts to work on the revitalization plan, allow safe and limited public access to the upper cave of the Lin Mahang Net My site. That's the background of the project. Uh, now I would like to talk about the scope of the projects. Lima Hang Lema is an industrial relic that consists of a size, structures, and landscape that provide evidence of past industrial process of the extraction of raw material. For conservation and revitalization of industrial heritage, the Dublin principle jointly prepared by uh, two international organizations for conservation of the heritage, the ICOMOS and TICCIH with the full name at the bottom of the, the slide. <clears throat> the guideline is referenced as an international recognized, recognized guideline to assist in the documentation, protection, conservation, and appreciation of industrial heritage. It covers four main aspects. First, uh, research and documentation study was carried out to record industrial structures, site landscape, and uh, related machinery uh, to record human skill and knowledge involved. Also studied the con connections of the historical, techno technological, and socio-economical socio dimension. Second, uh, to, for protection and conservation, Policy, legal, and administrative measures were established for, for the conservation of industrial heritage. And an uh, integrated inventory of the structure and sites and landscape was, shall also be uh, established for record. And protection measures are implemented to protect the industrial heritage structures. Third, to conserve and maintain the, the protected heritage. Uh, generally, uh, this heritage uh, shall be adaptively used and specialist support for maintenance and use of the heritage site should be provided. And all, and all enforcement of laws and regulation in an adaptive, in a adaptive way is necessary. Fourth, to present and communicate with the public about the uh, history of the heritage, to tell the public about the uh, heritage dimensions and value, raise public awareness, and use the heritage site for education, training, and research. The scope of the project covers four aspects of the Dupin principles. For research and documentation, 
<coughs> study of Lima Hang Mai was undertaken through literature review, text study, walkover survey, and interview with villagers of Nima Hang village. 3D scanning of the underground mining works to record the uh, profile of the tunnel and eddy and caverns. For protection and conservation, stability analysis and design of stabilization for cavern tunnel and slope were carried out to ensure the stability of mining works to be open to the public. Shafts in the mine area were identified for implementation of uh, safety measures. So, so uh, here is the end of my part. Uh, I'm going to pass to Kevin to talk about the details of the study. Uh, Kevin, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Kevin Stiles. Just briefly to describe the project, quite unique. The first occasion uh, that I've been involved in uh, that really does try and take advantage of our wonderful landscape heritage and our extraordinary mining and uh, no. <laughs> and geological uh, uh, the purpose is to make safe for public access the work is not about stabilizing the cabins to any sort of high degree of, no, <clears throat> of precision neither was the study to try and document to any high degree of study We're just can now the bottom shot is of course what we call the cavern gallery. And the top on the right hand side are some of the grills that were placed in 2017 across some of the adits. Okay. Now the landscape is is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, the area involved, Robin's Nest up to the left, downslope towards Lin Mahang. But the entire area just covered in dense vegetation. We're pretty much run through the history uh, of the previous speaker, so I won't, won't run over it again. But you can see in this recent drone image into 2021, Large areas of the spoil slope, the cavern, the level six cavern, that is the focus of the study, is in the central area. And of course, lots of loose spoil and, uh, and tracks and paths in the ravine. But the vegetation masks a great deal. Now, the way up from the frontier village of Lin Mahang in this wonderful, pristine, no, uh, virtually untouched hillside valley, you climb about 900 stairs up to the Macintosh Fort. Takes about 30 minutes, but generally it's a pretty good barrier for uh, anything but intrepid, no, intrepid hikers. But over the last 12 months or two years, it's amazing how many intrepid hikers are out there. 
no uh, all in lycra gear and most of them retirees and on any day we might see 20 30 on a weekend there could be 70 you know, 70 or 80 people going through this area and when you get up to the mackintosh fort the view to the northwest straight in straight across the border into shenzhen and you can see where the border lies it's, it's where the development starts and the Shamchung river just meanders its way through in the evening you can see all the way to Lantau Peak, Lantau Peak, Fung Wong San, Sunset Peak. And of course, Man San is the dominant feature in the territory. And northwest, wonderful, uh, wonderful sunset views. But a remarkable area in one of the most wild and wilderness locations that's left in the, uh, in the territory. Just over this ridge here, you've got North NT, the NENT landfill. Now, descending from the ridge line, about 150 meters, you end up in the cavern atrium, a large sort of cut area, which is, you know, has been given a, <clears throat> a slope registration number, as have about 30 or 40 of the obvious features in the area which are also part of the study for investigation. But we're looking to the, that looking towards the gallery and some of the, the grated adits, the grilled adits and the main entrance ways into the cavern gallery. Turn around 180 degrees and looking north, we're seeing other parts of the hillside and also another adit that heads off under the, uh, the lower level spur line. Now, some of the main features and some of the hazards for the public, remembering back to the earlier photo where everything's green. Now, the cavern gallery is obviously a uh, important feature, the atrium, the entrance to it, clearly, the grills, but nearby, adits, shafts, retaining walls, heaven forbid, greater than three meters in height, some of them in good condition, others not so good. Areas of subsidence, probably town hole, 10 meters in diameter, not many, but a couple. And of course, large old tailings adjacent to the, uh, to the cavern atrium. Elsewhere on the ridge, the old open pit, which was established no, before, before the 1920s, and depending on the uh, no, the water, no, depending on the rainfall intensity, time of the year, it can be bank full with two or three meters of water in it, or it can be almost dry. Feral pigs everywhere, and this sort of toxic. It looks sort of really pleasant, but it's rather toxic. And uh, some of the dragonflies are this incredible red color, which are quite. Uh, quite diagnostic. Elsewhere, we've got old uh, little feature here with, with double, double iron doors, which isn't very deep. It doesn't go anywhere, which we presume is an old explosive store. Nearby, we've got military and security. Macintosh fort on the top, on the top of old Second World War military installations. Now, uh, always wise to in any investigation to try and get to the location when where the conditions are not so good and the wonderful little stream that was constructed as part of the development as part of the mining heritage has actually been breached by a small cut slope failure and all the water that's coming down the drainage line ends up across one of the adits flows across the atrium and out through one of the edits into the across the tailings, and within the cabin gallery, with some grills for edit A one and A two and and edit two, we've got ponding water, but it doesn't last very long because most of this floor is ballast, based basically repositioned ballast that was infilled from old mining waste. To help restore the, 
the effects of the Japanese haphazard mining, where they created a, a level and a half. <laughs> now we tried to do some flow tests on the cabin floor, but very quickly, you no, know, the seepage, the ponded water just disappeared out of sight into the workings. To give you an insight of what it's like from behind the grills, behind the, the grill to add it to, looking back into the gallery, no, it's, a, it's another world, as you'd expect. And the, uh, the clever little openings within what are rather robust grills that require a fair bit of uh, Houdini, uh, Houdini-like action for especially the older generation to manage to get through. We climb up back out into the atrium and onto the tailings and the water pouring into the atrium, across the atrium floor, into at at six, flows across and exit across the top of the fill, the spoil rather, and then into the natural drainage line. And of course the view across across the border, only a couple of hundred yards away. Just extraordinary, absolutely brilliant. This is without doubt one of the most exciting pieces of work I have ever been involved in. No, and uh, congratulations to AFCD and GEO for, for getting this on the table. Part of the fun was the site history and the setting. We, today, totally dedicated, except for the obvious, uh, obvious spoil, We've still got some un ungrilled adits at level five, more on this side of the hillside as well, and lots going on over here, but you can't see it. Uh, a couple of occasions, dinner with Clarence Lee, the author of a couple of these books, and some of the anecdotal information was just extraordinary. This, of course, was supported by some of the villages and the surveys that was, were carried out with the villages. But, of course, we've got... Davis's, Davis's Geology of Hong Kong from the early 50s, and quite an informative little seminar that was held in 1964. Now it has Davis and Snellgrove in it, and uh, some interesting photos. 1938, when things got going, uh, a pretty impressive site, considering the border of China lies right on the Shum Chon here, and all the area in front were, were active terraces, rice paddies. One of the great finds were 1924 photographs and 1924, 1924 photographs in stereo. And you can see the open cut. You can even see in, in stereo the cavern, the cavern face and high reflectance indicating you know, uh, the loose spoil. We get to 1940, 45, the Japanese involved even more information into 86, 86, most of the features are quite obvious. The cavern, you can just see the shadow, the spoil, the open cut, you know, some races and shoots at the, uh, at the end of the ridge line. And this is about the point that it starts to, all these features start to disappear from sight. And we end up in, uh, in the 2000s with ever increasing uh, density of vegetation. But just to concentrate on two of the images, 1924, the open pit, a rather large spoil heap, uh, which is still very clearly stacked and, uh, and organised alongside it, some shafts nearby, and you can see clearly the atrium, uh, the cavern atrium wall here, the dark shadow, and the high reflectance of the spoil and some of the workings. And at the end here, the top of a chute that actually sent material downslope to the later workings. This area was, the mill was created in the, in the, in the mid thirties. But excitingly, we get into 1945 and look at this pock marked terrain. Shafts, adits, some subsidences, but tracks and pathways all over the place. And the compounds, you no know, mine buildings, the rather large spoil waste here, the mine office was just on the border road. You no, know, 
at this stage, the mill house had actually lost its roof and all the buildings had been stripped. You know? But much of the, no, much of the, uh, the landform is clearly obvious as being disturbed. The cavern atrium, also obvious. But you just come across here a little bit and there's rather strange sort of circular with a tail on like a tadpole, old military trenches, never observed, never observed before. Japanese trenches. Before the war, uh, before 1941, the Japanese, of course, were over the, over the, the border and the villages of Linmahang and Heung Waiyun used to go across and skirmish with them. So it wasn't any surprise that no, the Japanese were lobbing mortars back across, and most of the build, the mine buildings had Union Jacks on top of them. But after a war, after the war, of course, uh, there was a bit of settling of scores went on, and uh, for at least four years, very haphazard working within uh, within the mine area. But absolutely fabulous information, and a lot of this cross references with with some of the anecdotal information, but it also benchmarks other other practical realities. Early 50s, no, the <clears throat> before the Macintosh forts, which one of them would, the nearest one is about here, and over the ridge line, and this ridge here is the air, part of the area of the natural terrain study above the atrium. Robin's nest, the top of the ridge line. Hardly not a tree in sight, grassland vegetation. And of course, much of Linmahang Valley, lots of terraces now covered in dense vegetation. So we look at the 45 photograph again, the trenches are quite obvious. We can see all the workings that are sort of on the strike of the, the ore body, boom, in this sort of area through here. But we also see on the hillside, lots of remnants of other agricultural terraces. So you've got a, a plethora of, of interaction and uh, some discussions with Mick Ather, Dr. Ather. You know, the, it really is a palimpsestic terrain. You get layers of occupation with some of the final occupation coming, uh, being the mine workings. And of course, military conflict. So over the year, uh, recently, the anthropogene has been sort of proposed as, you know, as a bit of a, a new geological period you know, where man has interacted with the landscape and climate. But I, for this, these purposes, we'll deal with man interacting with the landscape. No better location in Hong Kong than this Linmahang area. All these features, most of them that are obvious in 1986, are given <clears throat> slope registration numbers, but nothing is known about them. And part of the study is to try and understand them and at least make safe if necessary. Now, just a couple of definitions. Anthropocene, period during which human activity has been the dominant influence for this purpose on environment, a landscape, and a palimpsest some that's something reused or altered but still bearing visible traces of its earlier form so that is our hillside that is this area we're in the anthropocene on top of the ore body now in the shingmun uh, Taimo, Taimo San formation but <clears throat> if we just move to the left most recently we have had high resolution lidar survey airborne lidar Look at the detail. The ridges, no, the, these trenches, which you couldn't see in the LIDAR of 2010, clearly obvious. The open cut, all the adits, shafts, areas of settlement, and all the pathways, clear and obvious and precisely defined in a hillshade model, just extraordinary. And of course, the combination of the recent photography, now the recent LIDAR survey, just stripping away the vegetation, just makes 
the whole environment so understandable. So I'm not going to run through the timeline, but 1924 aerial photographs, 1945 aerial photographs, really important. 1938 uh, oblique photos, 54 oblique photos, give understanding to the vertical photography. Now, just a couple of asides. Part of the, the wonder of this sort of work is going into the history. And we find Morrison Brown Jung in the 1920s. This is Morrison Brown, a rather fine looking Eurasian lad. And uh, born in 1876, he was the first mining and the first Chinese heritage mining engineer to graduate from Columbia, from the States, Columbia University. He worked for Sun Yat Sen. He ended up as chief engineer on the Hangtao reconstruction, the city reconstruction. But he ends up here in, uh, you know, in the mid 20s actively involved in Lin Mahang. And of course, something also pops up. You've got M.Y. Williams, part of the original survey team who came and did the very first geological mapping of Hong Kong. Williams, Uglo, Brock, they were all involved over a 20 year period. But poor old Jung, Williams went up and had a look at it and said, the mine is scarcely worth developing. After Mr. Jung had actually paid, <laughs> had secured a significant amount of money to uh, develop it, but he did go ahead. But so much valuable information that, that, that provides substance to our understanding of, of the territory, not to mention lots of detail about his wedding and the Mrs. You know, Mrs. Young and his birth and death and the family. Just so many interrelated bits and pieces which add substance to an extraordinary scene. And at this stage, must acknowledge you know, the industrial history site. Hugh Farmer and Simon Miller, so much work has been done, uh, done by them collating uh, all sorts of industrial history for the territory. And I absolutely commend to you, you know, uh, their website. And go online and find it. And also David Bellis with Gulu. There is so much information becoming available. Now, even to see a, a newspaper headline in the, uh, the mid-1930s, you know, it suddenly gives you a sense of, uh, of situational awareness uh, and the importance of these activities in this extremely remote area. And, of course, it was from 1936 that things kicked off. And, of course... We discovered, I am, gentlemen, your obedient servant, as the Hong Kong Mines Limited is told that uh, they've just had their lease cancelled in 1962. So fantastic bits and pieces that are coming together that uh, add value. Similarly, photographs, some records, identity of, of actual workings within no, within the study area, provide substance and documentation. So hopefully this is just a first, first, first phase and uh, further information will become available. Now, have to uh, take you underground for a little while. This, for a rather senior geologist, I've never had so much fun in a long, long time. It was, it was dark, it was hot, it was pretty treacherous, but uh, Norm, you would have loved to have been here, and uh, <laughs> it's just quite extraordinary. In through the grills for Adit 1A, you've got this almost skull-like feature. The stope going down goes to level five and a half, which we presume was an ad hoc, you know, ad hoc level, which you know, shouldn't, have been, shouldn't have been built, but other adits going off now, uh, <clears throat> provide more than just curiosity because you know, this one probably connects to one of the crown holes or an area of subsidence. On the left, you've got ore passes that are <laughs> unmarked, undocumented, you know, uh, stacked ballast with little wooden structures that still exist holding the, uh, holding the uh, well, not holding anything, but 
jammed in between the ballast and the uh, and the ceiling. The stope going down, the rough stope going down to level five and a half, and trying to do carry out a lidar survey with rocks and things that are sort of rolling under your feet was quite a challenge to our really dedicated young team. Old pillars that had been stripped, and uh, you know, the material around the edges no more than ballast that had been you know, been placed afterwards. And underground, a lot of order, you no. Know, Debris and rock that has been moved from place to place and stacked. No, not not ceiling collapse, but actually stacked and manoeuvred as they've managed to you know, shuttle rock around instead of sending it outside into uh, no into tailings. Another bore pass, and most of them thirty meters. No ballast. Some collapse, possibly up to uh, up to the, the area of subsidence, and other areas where it looks like collapse, but a lot of evidence of stacking. At least a forty meter ore pass, and of course, it's pitch black, unless it isn't. No apologies for dwelling here because this is part of an, ex an extraordinary little, uh, little mine area. And we never more never went more than about 100 metres, 150 metres from the, uh, the cavern atrium. Mike, Mike Wright disappearing off into, uh, in, in, into the distance. And this is just behind the wall. The cavern atrium is up here about five or 10 metres. And part of the ecological survey, we had our bat surveyors were down and we're in red light. And without trying to disturb the ecology too much, a variety of small bats. And of course, under the red light, they're all flying around you, fluttering and they fly up your face and turn around. Very clever. Now, back to our evolving digital world. Such a great location. I know uh, those who know me know I get a bit excited about you know, about these sorts of things. But to look at the detail of this hillside uh, in our 2020 lidar, the plan on the right hand side, one to one thousand, you actually couldn't draw it with the 2020 uh, with the 20 centimeter precision because it was all black. So we had to go back to produce a 1,000, a 1 to 1,000 plan. We needed to go to 0.5 of a metre. But the, but, but the precision of the 20 centimetre enabled us to do all some really interesting things on our hillsides. But it just astonishes me. No, green, covered, Dense vegetation, except for a couple of locations, not obvious. And you couple the vertical with handheld, and the handheld was inside the cabin. And of course, one of the difficulties was trying to you know, position the tunnel system, the cabin, and the adits with the airborne. As I said, precision was not particularly important but it really did provide some excellent learning opportunities. The distance between these in the atrium was less than ideal, probably 30 metres, but it should have been much larger, but constrained because of the size of the atrium. And trying to stumble around with a handheld, you know, with a handheld LIDAR up and, down, up and down stopes was a really interesting and challenging exercise. This is an extraordinary product of the LIDAR. Now, the cabin atrium in here, the grills, no, the grill one, at one and one B, stope that goes down to five and a half. Grill two, we had, I had a photo earlier looking through, grill two back across the cabin. And this at three, 
going back across underneath the atrium and then extending right around the outside. This is the atrium in here. This section through here is part of the wall of the cut slope, which forms the atrium. But added A6, runs off and actually will hopefully become part of the experience because it is relatively safe. Well, it's very safe and just runs straight through the tailings. You walk through here and come out at the vantage point and look straight over the border down the, down the hillside. So much of the you know, environment retained, but a lot of exploration going on inside the cabin area. Just a wonderful experience and continuing to try and understand the mine, just the physical relationship you can see here with the, the texture here, the, the handheld, trying to position it. You know, this hillside is a, you know, is a digital DEM with a, uh, <clears throat> with a digital overlay on, on top of it, but connecting as best we can with the old mine data. And of course, this is highly inaccurate, but we know that. But hopefully we can get some controls with later work with you know, and sort of reposition some of these from uh, some of the other edits. But <laughs> to visualize this area and strip the vegetation away just creates so much, so much detail. From the geotechnical side, the investigations were the mine cabin gallery, the existing man-made man features, there are about 25, 30 of them on the hillside around, and a natural terrain hazard study, just to, you know, to look at the area of the cabin atrium to make sure that it, you know, it was uh, relatively free of hazard, and if there were, to mitigate them. So not rocket science, investigations, standard data, death study, laser scan, survey, engineering, geological mapping, and pretty normal types of analysis. Without going to too much detail, the geotechnical issues were hanging rock blocks off the side of the ceiling, fractured rock mass, pillar conditions, weathered seams, and some of the potential, uh, potential measures Rockdale support with maybe you no know, uh, false rock, you know, fiberglass rock encasing them to make it make make, make them look more like the uh, the natural terrain. Some meshing possible. These are potential measures, not uh, not no decisions yet. Pillar buttresses, but somehow trying to mask them and make them look like the existing finney and some sort of minor tune amp protection across loose seams. But the whole intent, minimal works just to make safe without major disturbance. The natural terrain assessment, uh, pretty standard uh, for an area that looks nice and green, <laughs> but we know <laughs> we know has a lot of uh, a lot of things going on underneath it. So it was just a brilliant opportunity, you no. Know, to look at hillside pocket scenarios and, and add those to the other five hazards in, uh, in GEO 2016. Hillside pockets are effectively man-made features on the hillside. And if they happen to be an adverse setting, then they need to be mitigated. But in order to do so, we tried to enhance our anthropogenic mapping, uh, mapping system and classification. So we're doing an inventory within the no, within the study area. And interestingly, no ENTLI features. I think Geo did a brilliant job choosing the, uh, the location. <clears throat> but such was the detail of the 2020, you know, the 2020 LIDAR, the surface LIDAR, that it just gave us an opportunity to start exploring terrain surface heterogeneity. No clever algorithms, just basically the point source data. Much of this area was helicopter born, so it was sideborne. No, it's it's sort of normal. So it wasn't just 
vertical penetration through vegetation because it was normal to the contour, uh, normal to the contour, it was shooting under much of the vegetation, the canopy anyway. And we look forward to be able to, you know, to do quite a bit of work on uh, many of these features on this part of the hillside, which happens to be old disturbed terrain associated with old agricultural land use, quite apart from the major impacts of the shafts and the adits. So lots going on. The, the trench system, metre and a half, two and a half metres thick, really clearly defined on this ridge. But lots of opportunity to explore at the HKIE uh, seminar in a few weeks' time. We've got two papers coming out, one on the, uh, on the geotechnical assessment and another on, uh, on the anthrop uh, <coughs> on the anthrop classification but just from an educational the display and vantage so not trying to do anything really spectacular educational facility near the mcintosh fort something you know some viewing area near the cavern and another vantage around on the uh, you know, around on the fill on the loose on the, on the spoil in a safe spot after you walk through part of the adit looking across into the wutong no, wutong national park up to the top of china mountain and a lot no, and, a, and a center educational center in Linmahung itself so you know the sorts of things that might be on display uh, at least photographs probably not specimens but some photos some cross sections, uh, geological maps, some of the heritage. And of course, there'll be an ecological display for the bats and the vantage. There'll be a viewing platform, a modest viewing platform in this location that you actually enter via one of the adits. It's about a 40 meter trip through uh, the adit. It's got a bit of a bend in it. So it looks rather black and then opens up. And the view across to uh, across the border. It's spectacular country, really exciting. The takeaways for me, you now this project a remarkable opportunity to promote an outstanding geological, industrial mining heritage and ecological resource to the public. Not often we're just you know, <laughs> geotechnical engineers and geologists get together and do stuff just for the public. And hopefully this is one of them. Goes a, you know, something against the run of play. And share the local history of the Lin Mahung villages dating back at least a millennia. And stimulate awareness and study of the diversity of old Anthrop, including the palimpsestic nature of the, no, of the ancient agricultural practices, mining, prospecting, military and other features now often hidden by thick vegetation on our green hillsides. This is not the only location. No, nope. there are many hillsides, not necessarily related to, uh, to mining, that have a plethora of interest from an anthropological point of view and archaeological. And to develop innovative educational measures to develop and promote knowledge of the Anthropocene and respect for our environment I think we're looking at VR. You can imagine taking that digital LIDAR data and turning it into a VR experience inside the caverns, inside the grills. Six or eight augmented, augmented reality with it. And wow, you've got some sort of experience. And if we can't manage to connect with the public, I don't know how we could otherwise. And finally, I think this is really important, an opportunity to showcase the applications of the 2020 Territory Ride LIDAR and other digital systems for the benefit of the public. Now we've got so many of these wonderful, you know, this wonderful technology that we can do more with. Now, a great opportunity for GEO to, uh, to really take a lead. Now, for me, a wonderful project 
Sincere thanks to the project teams of AFCD, GEO, and Meinhardt, particularly you know, Samson and, uh, and Mike Wright, you know, Jeff Pook, Pe- uh, Petra, Francis, absolutely fantastic. And we need more opportunities for exciting educational outcomes involving the community at large. All right, hopefully just to start. For me, a personal view. As the, as the current chair of the, uh, the Hong Kong Regional Group of the Geological Society, geologists are time travellers, and we've, we visit the past and the future on a day-to-day basis. Geologists deal with uncertainty on a day-to-day basis, and our job, if we do it well, is to make the past relevant. Making the past relevant is the key. No, we deal with uncertainty, and somehow we've got to provide certainty to others. And it's it's a challenge. But never have I been involved in a project where this comes together in a better in a better way. So, plea to uh, to my to our fellow groups. We we participate together in so many activities. More interaction between the professional organisations education and community awareness. We've got the techniques that are going to enthuse young people and we do it within professional standards and multidisciplinary interaction. So thank you very much, Tim. Thank you for the opportunity. KH and Norman, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Norman, uh, Kevin, and Kale. Uh, fascinating, uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, it's true what you say, Kevin, that you know, the past couple of years, I think, being constricted in Hong Kong, you have a lot more people out on the hiking trails, um, exploring all the different sites, uh, abandoned <laughs> military facilities to the mines. Um, yes, the uh, urban and the you know, uh, natural environment exploration has really uh, taken off. It's be f- fantastic to see the site properly developed um, in a safe manner. As you say, you don't want people falling down uh, or shafts or at it. I think the key, I think a key is here that you now it's softly, softly. Uh, and it's very, you know, when people get exuberant about things and get, uh, and procedures get involved, it's very difficult to remain, to keep that softly, softly touch. And I think this is a situation in which success will come from a soft touch. Yeah, uh, there's also the notion of trying to still um, preserve what's there. Um, I know on some hiking trails we've been on, they have military sites where there isn't any maintenance. So you think, yes, softly, softly but also um, other ways to protect what remains. Um, so we have, um, are there any questions? Please put them into the chat. There have been a few um, comments and questions I'll quickly go through. Um, someone, Stevens mentioned that he was involved with the tender and uh, construction of the site preparation contract for CLK, which included leveling. Uh, of Brothers Island and doesn't remember any mention um, in the tender documents that there have been any mining them, Norman. So uh, interesting, <laughs> interesting comment there. <clears throat> yes, I think that must have been a shortcoming uh, for the client. <laughs> they didn't do their research very well. <laughs> uh, possibly. Um, then another. Very... Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, no, please oh. go, Norman. Now, uh, um, I, I would personally be very interested to know what the airport authority did with the underground workings. Um, did they fill them in? Uh, because presumably, um, you know, there would still have been these underground workings, these open underground workings. And did they, were they considered when they designed the foundations of the various structures that the airport authority constructed on the island. Anyway, you won't be able to answer that question, but. <laughs> no, but uh, it's true that um, there's another comment here about having with uh, excavating Tate Can Tunnel, 
there encountered uh, an unknown adit, which was full of water, obviously flood, badly flooded the tunnel. Um, so additional information that comes through, whether from the LIDAR survey, uh, you know, Kevin, or other ones, I think would be very useful for future development. Um, perhaps it, I, the images, Kevin, that you were showing of, obviously now most of the slopes in Hong Kong are absolutely covered in forest. Um, it was very green, but seeing the clarity of the detail and seeing those pop marks come through from the LIDAR survey are really incredible to see the application yeah. of the technology. Yeah, absolutely. Are there, um, so Kevin, is it, um, you mentioned on one of your last slides there that there's a territory wide. Is that specific to that area or for um, the greater the larger territory within Hong Kong? Kevin. Kevin, sorry, we can't hear you. I don't know if your microphone's on mute. Sorry, uh, Tim, everyone in the Pool Y building, we can't actually hear you. Yeah, actually, Geo has some services not doing uh, territorial spies. Spy survey has requested particular locations and where it can be set up a drum and, and do it. And this is the, as I, my knowledge is, it got such a survey and the services more than 10 years around. I, what I experienced in the LQ area, survey on, on the LIDAR services and the others. And actually, that's not only LIDAR. But I also have the other other uh, photometry and and the uh, and, uh, and the surveying as such. So I do think there's still in developing uh, in both in skill and uh, also the 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 as a request for portrait in 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 the in the region actually. Yeah, it's still developing. Yeah, and many actually and many many consultants as I know is already developing uh, their teams for serving their company in the particular service contract with the government in particular. And that's another. <laughs> um, the question has come up um, for Norman, um, wondering if you knew about the abandoned wolframite and quartz mine near Shallow One on Lantau, and wondering if that had been included in your investigation in the 90s. Yeah, that, that was a that was a question from Denise, wasn't it? Yes. In GEO. Um, yeah, I mean, our focus, as I mentioned earlier on, was on four of the particular mines uh, because they were the most uh, productive of the, the four mines. But we did pay brief visits to many other places where there'd been mining activity, uh, whether it was actual mining or whether it was um, exploratory work. And we went up to the top of the ridge in Charlotte One. And even in those days, it was heavily overgrown. There were, there were some abandoned buildings up the top there. I don't recall seeing any shafts or I, I don't recall falling down any shafts up the top there, um, but we knew about it. And um, I'm sure we, ha we had somewhere, we had some information about the mining in that particular area. So, so maybe what I could do, Jennifer, as I mentioned to you and Tim before, was okay. um, after this, maybe tomorrow, I can put together um, um, maybe a Word document with the various source of information about the abandoned mines. I, I mean, certainly... I think that our work in the early 90s sparked an interest in the abandoned mines, but subsequently there has been so much written and so much interest, um, partly by the Geological Society of Hong Kong, but also this organization called, I think it's called Hong Kong 
industrial heritage group who produce some so actually amazing, amazing stuff. So I'll put together some, um, you know, a summary of the source of information. I'll send it to you guys, and then maybe you can pass it on to all the other participants in this well, webinar. Thank you. I'm thank you, sure Norman. there seems to be a lot of um, comments uh, just saying how yeah, wonderful, really interesting, and hoping to see other similar initiatives at other geo sites in, in the future. Um, mm. And also saying how impressive the underground uh, LIDAR was. Um, I know Kevin yeah, had amazing. to, yeah, it was fantastic. There's been um, one last question come in in terms of obviously some uh, hikers and mineral collectors and um, people in Hong Kong and their borders um, open. There's an interest and uh, desire to explore. Um, what are the thoughts on balancing the preservation and safety of the sites and that desire to explore um, and collect specimens? Um, put that to the floor. Who's this? Um, <coughs> I get, I don't know. If, Kale or from Geo? Um... Give a go. Yes. Uh, from safety point of view, uh, it is not advisable to uh, go into the uh, relic site or mine, mining because there's a lot of potential risk in there. The shafts and unstable rocks, <coughs> and uh, uh, also the best uh, they make uh, confirmed virus. So, uh, it is uh, not advised. Uh, uh, we it's not necessary. Uh, it, we should not go into the these uh, abandoned mines to uh, to avoid these risks and uh, protect yourself. Yeah. So, but uh, we understanding. I can see find in the YouTube. Uh, there's a lot of uh, clips uh, of the general public uh, taking adventures in those. Uh, uh, abandoned mines, say uh, in Nimahang, uh, Mount Shan, that mm -hmm. those sites attract lots of people. Uh, so we are done, we understand uh, there's a there's a, a, a expectation from the public to turn those abandoned mines into a tourist attraction. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. So maybe Mount Shan will be the next. No, no, no. Uh, no, no idea. No, uh, no, no. Yes, uh, the Limahang My project would be uh, welcomed by the public. Yeah. Hmm. Well, definitely not, Kale. Um, Ma On San, in the past, uh, when I was in Hong Kong, proposals were put, put forward by um, private companies to. One, one in particular was for a private residential development in, in the vicinity of Maun San Chun. And as a part of that proposal, they were going to open up part of the Maun San mine, the underground workings. I don't believe that project, I think that was uh, Shun Wan? No, no, Sunung Kai, sorry. I don't think that ever went ahead. And certainly opening up these abandoned mines or just parts of them you you would have to get agreement from various government organizations like fire service department the emergency services in general and of course geo and i'm sure even if it was only a small portion of the underground workings you would a geo i know very well because i worked there for years um, they would insist on um, lots of stabilization works, probably including shock creating. Now, if you want to retain the authenticity of the mines, what you don't want is to go into a tunnel where, where the, the sides and the ceiling are just covered in shock creat. As I say, you, you lose authenticity. So I don't think that's going to happen. They tried it at Muiwo in connection with the, the Muiwo what was it called, facelift project for the, the silver mine cave. And it's, sorry, sorry to 
say this, but it's, it's pretty pathetic, actually. <laughs> they, they made it look very nice outside. And all you do, you get a glimpse through this um, small opening and you can like see a short distance in. But opening up old mines is, in my opinion, is a non-starter. That's my personal opinion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I don't seem to have any more questions. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Norman, and Kevin, and KL for your fascinating talk. We have lots of thanks uh, also come in through the comments section. Um, really interesting. And I look forward to being able to visit the site once it's uh, been developed and opens up to the public. So um, yes, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, for joining us this evening. And thank you so much, uh, Norman, Kevin, and Kale for um, joining us and talking to us this evening. So a round of applause to our speakers. And um, thank you very much. Thanks, Jennifer. And good luck next year. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs>